Okay, weird vacation, I don't know, Tuesday. <laughs> uh, but I liked it. <laughs> okay, so we've got a lab this week, right? It's three o'clock, it, down in the Anacoic lab, all right? Uh, and, we, and we're doing these lab discussions for the second experiment. So if you haven't signed up for a time, do it soon. Uh, okay, so we're going to begin, today we're going to begin uh, this next chapter. It's on the attenuation, also known as the absorption of sound. Uh, we've, so far we've been neglecting losses, acoustic losses, right? Well, we're going to look at those now. And they turn out to be quite interesting, as you'll see. And in fact, it appears that there's more research that can be done on this. And I'll point this out to you next week when we get deeper into this. <coughs> Um, oh, let me say here that some of these loss mechanisms were, were actually not understood until the 1970s. In fact, a, uh, a person who became famous for, um, in his dissertation, well, very well known in his dissert, PhD dissertation, um, graduated in the early 70s. And he's the one who hired me at my previous university, incidentally. <laughs> um, so we'll, we'll discuss a little bit of the history. When we get into this, we'll discuss a little bit of the history. And it's, it's quite interesting, as you'll see, and surprising. So um, there are two types of losses that in, in, a, in acoustics. We need to, two rough categories here, big categories. One we call bulk losses. These are losses in the bulk, and what people mean by that is away from boundaries. Really, that's what it means. It's due to the medium itself and not due to the presence of boundaries, okay? And the reason we distinguish that is that there are losses near the boundaries. There's what's called a boundary layer. Some of you have probably heard that in fluid mechanics before. And there are losses associated with that boundary layer. So we don't have time to discuss this. Both of these are in KFCS. Um, and I've used both of them for research projects that I've been involved with. Uh, we only have to, we're just going to talk about the bulk losses. And so, but these are in here, and if you need them, like I did it at least once, some you just look them up. That's what everybody else in the world does, right? I told you guys, most people don't have the luxury of having a course in KFCS. Most acousticians don't. They just look at it when they need it, which is really unfortunate. Okay, so if it does arise in your research, it's in there. You can look it up. Now, an important thing to realize here is that um, a sound wave is going to, because of losses, it's going to attenuate the amplitude. If it's a, its amplitude will go down, whether it's a traveling wave or a standing wave. The amplitude will go down in space or time. Uh, where does that energy go? We know that the sound carries energy. That's obvious, and we've quantified that. Where does that energy ultimately end? Well, almost always it just ends up as heat. It's a typical case for the dissipation of energy. And, uh, and not just acoustics, but other systems too. It ultimately ends up at heat. At heat. Now there's a uh, current exception going on. People are actually working on harvesting acoustical energy, believe it or not, even though it contains very little energy. Um, and this is opened up for not just sound in a fluent, but, but vibrations, vibrations of, like ship vibrations. So I'm actually, co I don't know if I told you, but I'm co-advising a, a thesis on that right now. He, uh, Tim Householder, he graduates this quarter. Uh, okay, so this theory that we're going to be developing here is not, it's not obvious, all right? And I found that it helps, um, in understanding what's going on here, it helps to first go through a pretty simple thermodynamics example. Okay, because the concept, there's a concept here, as we will see, and that concept will carry over to acoustics. So what's <coughs> not obvious here is that a time delay plays a critical role in, in losses. All right, so it's not obvious. 
So that's why we, we're going to look at this example first before we see what happens in acoustics. Um, so here's an idea, simple standard thermodynamics type idea, uh, piston cylinder, you've got some fluid in there, um, I'm, I call it a gas, I don't know why. I don't know why I called it a gas, it, you know, it really could be a fluid, just in general a fluid. And there's some external agent here that can compress or expand the fluid in the cylinder. The, the, the cylinder is thermally connected to um, uh, what we call a temperature reservoir. This is a large, relatively large volume that's at a constant temperature T0. So the, one, the reason you want to think of it as large is that when I compress this piston in, this gas is going to tend to heat up, right? Which will cause heat to flow here. The temperature doesn't change. It's, it's much bigger than the size of the system. That's why we call it a reservoir. Okay, so here's what you wanted to notice here. What if we move the piston in quickly? Okay, so suppose we move the piston in rapidly. The gas will heat up. How much heat will flow to the reservoir? The reservoir. Well, if we, we move it quickly, the diffusion heat's typically very slow. We move it sufficiently fast, it, it, the heat won't flow. Okay? Now, we have to, there's a uh, caveat here. You notice I say, but not too quickly. I'm going to see if I can fit in the reason here. The reason we can't do it too quickly is because if you do it sufficiently fast, you're going to generate a shock wave. That shock wave, of course, has energy and it's going to bang back and forth around it. It will dissipate, it will dissipate energy. So by fast here, we want to mean fast compared to the thermal diffusion, the diffusion of heat here. So it doesn't have time to do it, but not fast enough that we generate a shock wave, which is nonlinear, okay? We want to stay linear here. What if we then, we compress it, what if we then hold the piston motionless? Well, then there's going to be time. If we hold it, compress it somewhat here, there'll be time for the heat to flow. All right? So here's where we're headed with this. We want to look typical thermodynamics. We look at a cycle in the pressure volume plane. So here we are. This is the pressure inside the um, cylinder. This is the volume of the cylinder. And we have some start point here, which is going to be our finish point. We're going to operate in a cycle. We do this compression. If we do it fast, although not too fast, the temperature will rise because there's no time for the heat to go to the reservoir. Right? So the temperature will rise. This is called an adiabatic, as we know. It's an adiabatic. That's what sound is, incidentally. But this is an adiabatic compression. It will rise along this curve here. And then we stop it for a while. The pressure will then go, the, the temperature is higher here. It will eventually equilibrate with the reservoir and have temperature T0. So the pressure, as the temperature goes down, the pressure will go down and eventually the temperature of the fluid in the cylinder will be T0, the same as the reservoir. So it'll be on this ice, this is called an isotherm right here. It'll be right here. Now, we want to go in a cycle here. This is uh, very common in thermodynamics for practical reasons. It's common for us because for us, we have sound waves that are cycling through. You know, they're swinging. The pressure and acoustic variables are cycling through. So now we want to expand the fluid. Again, we do it quickly. This will be an adiabatic expansion. If we do it quickly so the, so the heat can't come in from the reservoir, doesn't have time to come in, here. As we withdraw the piston here, this is going to cool. This has to cool because it's doing work on us now, on the, on the external agent. External agent moving this way. There's a pressure here. And we're actually doing negative work. The, the piston is doing, the, the gas here is doing work on us. Its temperature has to go down. And if we do it quickly, it'll drop below T0. And then to complete the cycle, we stop it here and wait, and it, it will um, 
because it's colder, sleep, heat will diffuse in from the reservoir and come back to our starting point. Now, what's, do you remember any thermodynamics? What's the big deal here? Work. What's work? A little, an element of work. This is the work done by, and I'm going to edit this in, improve this a little bit. There's work done by the external, the external agent that's controlling the piston, okay? And in general, work is force times distance. If you divide by the cross-sectional area, I guess we call this S, and multiply, you can see that this is the pressure and this is the change in volume. So in thermodynamics here, the typical mechanical work element is the pressure, PdV. So the work that I do, the external agent does, in compressing is going to be the area under this curve because it's the integral of PdV, PdV. All right, so I've done this work. Now there's no work involved here, there's no change in volume. As I withdraw the piston out, the system does work on me. This is the work underneath here. That area is the work that the system does on me. So the, the whole point here is that in one cycle, there's net work, net positive work. Therefore, energy has gone into the system. The external agent has, um, for a complete cycle, even though the system has, ends up, the fluid in the, in the, the fluid in the cylinder ends up at the same condition it started with, there's been a change in the system. What is that change? Well, you know, we put work in, where's it gone? It's gone into the reservoir. Exactly. So the reservoir has changed. Its temperature is the same. Huh. Well, you know, it's, it's big, right? Its temperature is the same, but its energy has increased. Okay, even though its, te its temperature has gone up very slightly. That's, I guess, what I have to, I've got myself in a corner here. The temperature has gone up very slightly. <clears throat> now, so this is a nice, sometimes this is called an articulated cycle. This is not a, a very, usually a very practical thing, and it's very abrupt here, but it's convenient for us to do this, think of this cycle. There's um, more that's going on here. Suppose we don't push it in, um, oh, suppose we, we push it in quickly, and then we turn right around and withdraw it without waiting. What's the, what's going to happen? We're going to go, we follow this curve. We're just going to retrace this curve on the way back. Because we haven't, there, we haven't allowed any time for the temperature and therefore the pressure to go down. So we're just going to go right along this adiabat here. And we go along the adiabat, we come right back along. What's the work that we do? Zero, because there's no area, right? So the time here, or the time, more specifically, the time delay is playing an important role. And that's the essential feature here, as we'll see. There's another limiting case we can look at. What if we do it very slowly? If we do it very slowly, what do we move along here? The isotherm, we're going to go up. And then when we come back, what's the work done? Zero. OK? So you can see that the. Um, it's the, all I can tell you at this point is the time delay plays an important role here, you'll notice. And we'll see, we'll start to see how that comes into acoustics um, later in the lecture. <coughs> um, now, uh, right. Now I want to point out here that We've done this so-called articulated cycle just for convenience. You can imagine um, doing this sinusoidally. You know, this is typically more practical. And you can still, as long as you have, as long as you don't do it, if you do it extremely slowly, so imagine we have this sinusoidal drive, right? If you do it, again, if you do it very quickly, you're going to be right you're going to be along there. If you do it very slowly, you're going to be along here. In between, it's going to look, it'll be smoothed out here. Okay? 
So the total work will be less because it's going to get we're going to, it's going to be it's going to be uh, smoothed out like this. But it'll still be there. There'll still be non-zero positive work being done by the external agent. So energy the so energy of the system the total system goes up. There's heat that's being deposited in the reservoir. Okay, so um, we'll come, this is just a simple thermodynamics example to get, to get this idea of the time delay playing in a role here. And we'll see it starting to come up, we'll see it in our treatment of acoustics here. So how do we do acoustics, how do we do theoretical acoustics including dissipation? Well, we've got to generalize Euler's equation. There are now viscous forces. We neglected these before. So before, when we derived Euler's equation, we came up with, the, you'll recognize that as the exact Euler's equation. Uh, and of course, for linear acoustics, we linearized it. But that was Euler's equation in the absence of, which, which is in the absence of dissipation. When you include dissipation, this leads to what's called the Navier-Stokes equation. Now, many of you are prob probably familiar with the Navier-Stokes equation for incompressible flow. That's no good for us here, almost always in acoustics, because acoustics involves compressions and expansions. So here's the full Navier-Stokes, um, the Navier-Stokes equation for compressible flow. And there are these two additional terms here. These are the, um, this is, these are the viscosity terms. These coefficients here are the shear viscosity coefficients, and there's two types. There's a shear coefficient of viscosity, and there's a bulk, co a bulk volume change coefficient of viscosity. We'll talk a little more next week about the distinction between these two, but for right now, I want you to just accept, just accept this. This can be derived. These two addition, we derive this. These two additional terms can be derived. We're not going to do that. It takes a fair amount of effort. But we're going to discuss, it's important to realize how they come about, what's going on here. How does this, this is a kind of friction in a fluid that comes about. How does it come about? And for those of you who haven't heard this before, it'll probably surprise you. So here's a qualitative example. You can have, you can imagine, for example, that you have some container of honey and you have honey, you know, like bee honey. I guess there's only, yeah, whatever. <laughs> it just seems strange to say honey. <laughs> um, and you have a plate, okay? The plate's in there. You pull the plate out or you insert it in, you're going to feel friction, right? No, everyone's probably experienced this, in, if not with honey, with something else, okay? There's a kind of fluid friction there, and you think, well, yeah, it's like contact friction. Well, it's not, it's not like contact friction. It's fundamentally different. It's the same effect. If I have, let's look horizontally here. If I have this plate and a fluid between the plate here that I'm going to move, that I'm moving at constant velocity, let's say, and there's a surface at rest here, I'm going to feel, I have to exert a force to keep it moving at constant velocity, right? There's a frictional force there, right? So it's similar to what you would have, what you would see here. But it's fundamentally different because of wh why it comes about. And, wh and why it comes about is, is very interesting here. The fluid, fluid particles right on the face here will stick to the face. That's called the no-slip boundary condition. I think we might have talked a little bit about that before in the previous chapter. But anyway, the overwhelming standard case is that fluid particles stick. They're at motionless rest, at rest. They're at rest relative to a surface. All right? So because we're moving this, they're going to be moving along like that. Now, we're at some finite temperature here. Things are jiggling around, right? So if you look at any one fluid particle, it won't permanently stay stuck there. It will, because of thermal agitation, it will depart and another one will come in. It works both ways. Fluid particles will continually be sticking and unsticking from the surface there. So look at the effect of that is this. Suppose 
a particle becomes unstuck, moves down here, and another one essentially takes its place. That particle came from down here, right? What's its velocity, average velocity, relative to the velocity of the surface? You see the velocity profile? This is the average velocity profile here. This is what we call the, um, the ordered flow. I'm not, rep I'm not representing the thermal agitation flow. So this is like the average velocity. Impressed upon this will be this thermal agitation where these particles are moving around and migrating, right? So a particle that comes and sticks on here, it comes from down here. The velocity, the average velocity down here is less than the velocity of the plate, right? Because of this boundary condition. So what's going to happen when it sticks to the plate and it doesn't have the velocity of the plate? What do you have to do? You've got to exert a force. You have to increase the momentum of that particle to get it to move with the speed of that. And that requires, that requires a force. That's the nature of the viscous frictional force in a fluid. Here it's, a, it's complicated here. It's continual break, forming and breaking of bonds. But here it's due to diffusion. It's due to the fact that at a finite temperature, these particles diffuse. And the particles down here have less momentum than they had if they'd stick here. So we have to supply that force. Without us supplying a force, the plate will come to rest, as you know. Now, that's sort of half of the picture. The other half is, what about, the particle that, what about particles that leave the surface here? What do they do? They, come, they migrate down here. Now, they have greater velocity, average velocity, than the particles down here, right? So what are they going to do in time? They're going to have collisions. They're going to give up their energy for other particles. What happens in here? The temperature goes up. Now, it typically goes up in, for typical fluids, typical situations, a very small amount. It would be hard to measure it, but it is fundamentally there, okay? I'm doing work on this system. I'm putting energy in that system. That energy's got to be going somewhere. This is a steady state situation where the kinetic energy is not changing here. The overall, you know, the macroscopic kinetic energy, not changing. It's a steady state, constant velocity. But something's changing, isn't it? It's that agitation, the thermal agitation. There's more. There's more microscopic kinetic energy, which is what we call heat. So this is um, uh, amazing. A lot of students don't, I remember the first time I saw this, I, uh, wasn't that long ago. <laughs> um, it, it's remarkable. This is what's going on. This is why there is shear viscosity, this, this fluid frictional force. Uh, okay, so, uh, let me see what's next here. The second term involves the curl of the curl of the velocity. And for those of you who know a little fluid dynamics, a curl represents a sort of vortex type motion. Circulation is a better word. And in acoustics, always or almost always, this only happens near boundaries. Okay, not out in the bulk medium for acoustics. So in fact, we, I don't know if you remember this, but we quantitatively we, we somewhat, for linear acoustics, we actually derived this. I don't know if you remember the curl of v, u being zero. If you look back, way back in the first part of the course, we actually showed that, that the curl of u for linear, for linear acoustics has to be zero. However, near a boundary, this, this doesn't have to be true, okay? In general, it's not true. So there will, this, but, so there will, this is associated with losses near a boundary, which we're going to have to neglect here. So we're not going to worry about that, about this, this effect. And it's very easily eliminated in the analysis, as you will see in a minute. So we're going to be focusing, as you'll see, we're going to be focusing on this term. And it's fine that we do that because this is only associated with near the boundaries, and we're not going to do acoustic absorption due to um, sound near boundaries. So how do we proceed here, analytically? Well, you know how we're going to do it. The first thing, what do we do with this term? It's gone, because we just want to do linear acoustics, right? What do we do with this factor? Well, this is already, in some sense, small. So 
the fact that rho is changing is going to be second order when I'm all, you know, it's going to be, that's a second order effect. So I just set rho equal to rho naught. So this is what we call linearization. All right? And this is, uh, can we throw this away? No, it's linear, right? So we've got to keep that. And here's the equation. This is the linearized equation of continuity for the condensation. Remember how the fractional change in density? Um, it's been linearized. It's about some equilibrium, small deviations about some equilibrium state. This is still going to be true. We have to conserve mass. So that's still true. What about the pressure condensation, the thermal, we called it the thermodynamic relationship, relationship between pressure and condensation. This is linearized. I'm going to add that in here. This is linearized, as you may remember. And um, the C squared here is how the pressure changes with density adiabatically. That's what we're interested in for acoustics. This will also be true for linear acoustics. So we, again, we have our sort of three equations or five if you want to count Euler's equation. It's a vector equation, so you can count it as three, however you want to count it. We have one thing that's different here. Well, um, let me, I should say this. The next thing you want to do is you want to take the divergence of the Navier-Stokes compressible equation. What happens when we take the divergence? Of, this is going to be linearized, okay? So we're going to get what we've got before here. We're going to have the Right, and there's a little Laplace in here. What's the divergence of any curl? Kind of rolls off your tongue. Yeah, the divergence of any curl is zero. So we can actually el eliminate this term. That doesn't mean we're eliminating the effect, okay? <laughs> so um, it's there, but you gotta be near a surface and we're, not, we're interested in the bulk. And this plays a negligible role in the bulk. This term. There is a bulk viscosity contribution here. We'll talk about that next week. But this term right here is not going to play a role. And we can actually easily eliminate it. We would naturally do it. Because what we want to come up with is a wave equation. We want to see how the, I, just, I should have told you this earlier. What we're interested in here is coming up with the modified wave equation. We, we have the lossless wave equation. We now want to include losses. So we take the divergence. That's going to go away. And now the only thing that, um, is different here is this term right here. The divergence of the gradient is the Laplacian, so we'll have that term. <coughs> and you'll notice that conveniently, what we're dealing with here is the divergence of view. That's exactly what we're going to get here when we take the divergence and we interchange the space and time operations. So remember how we, elim we, we eliminated um, S u to just get one equation and one unknown in the acoustic pressure. We can do the same thing here. And in fact, it's so simple that I'm just going to give you the result. There's that one extra term that we're carrying along. This one extra term right here that gets carried along in our reduction down to one equation and one unknown. It's, it's this right here. This is just a constant. This is going to be the Laplacian on the divergence of u. So you can almost do it in your head. And here's what you get. Now, um, this tau sub s here is the, uh, called the viscous relaxation time. It has to have units of time. It involves constants of the fluid, the, viscous, the viscosity coefficients here. And it's easy to derive this. It has to have units of time because we've got this time derivative here. This has to be dimensionless. It's called the viscous relaxation time. And what it is, is it's associated with the fact that um, if, you, if you consider a change in the system, if we have a fluid and we abruptly alter the pressure or something, make some abrupt change in there, the fluid won't instantly respond due to viscosity. Because of viscosity, it's going to lag behind. Very reasonable, right? It won't respond instantly. And there's a characteristic time associated with it for it to respond. And that's this viscous relaxation time. And I'm going to show you, uh, give you a better feel for this uh, very soon here. But let me make sure I'm not missing something here. Oh, right. The first thing, of course, is that 
when we have no viscosity, the viscous relaxation time is zero, and we're back to our standard wave equation. That's the first thing to notice. So to get a feeling for why this is a, for this so-called relaxation time here, it's best to, um, this term is really not playing any essential role here. So we can, to make life easier, to appreciate this, we're going to assume that the speed of sound is very large. That's equivalent to saying that you're, you're making slow changes. If you make, um, if you make slow, ch slow changes, the speed of uh, sufficiently slow compared to the speed of sound, the system will be changing as a whole. And you don't have to worry about this, this, this term right here. So we're going to, for this simple argument here, we're going to neglect this term. And then here's what we get. The fact that we're dealing with the um, Laplacian on the pressure is not important. We're just going to call it some function f. So we get this simple equation. And this equation is uh, amazing. You've all pro you all probably saw it in differential equations. But it probably didn't stick. But it's a really important equation. And interestingly enough, engi most engineers are well aware of this. Physicists aren't, which you know, physicists aren't perfect, maybe nearly perfect, but they're not perfect, right? And this is one of the areas where physicists fall short, um, is that it, I, I didn't see this until I was in graduate school. Now, I probably saw it in a differential an introductory differential equations course, but I didn't realize how important it was. It's a very simple equation. It's a first order, it's linear, and it's first order. And you know what the solution is. This, this is the general solution. The general solution will have one constant, one constant of integration because it's a first order differential equation. And you can verify that, you can do it in your head. If you substitute this in, you'll verify that it, that it solves the equation. Um, and you can see here that this tau sub s, what it does is, the way we want to look at this is, we have some initial condition. We've, we impose some initial condition on this function f. All right, we kick, we kick f. And then we, it's, so it has some initial condition, but we're not driving f, there's no drive on here. So what's gonna happen in time is f is gonna go to its equilibrium solution, which is just zero. You can see that the solution of this, a solution to this equation is zero, right? And physically what that represents is um, that's the equilibrium state that, that the system's going to go to in time, okay? But we can start it at any initial condition. We can give it any kind of kick. And when we give it a kick, that means we're not going to have A equals zero, our equilibrium solution. The system will relax. We say that it relaxes to equilibrium zero, and it does so exponentially. Almost all systems relax exponentially to equilibrium when you kick them, okay? There are some interesting exceptions to that, but they're very unusual. And we've shown this here. And furthermore, quantitatively, what's the characteristic time you have to wait? It's this tau sub s, okay? And if you want to be careful, you can wait five. You know, five, there's a time constant here. You can wait five time constants if you want, or 10. We did an experiment once where we had to wait 10 time constants, okay? With a lock-in amplifier in order to get accurate data. So. Some of you are familiar with time constants. You have to, you know, wait a certain time for the system to come into equilibrium before you take data, for example. So it's up to you what you want to wait. But, but this tau s here is, is, is a time constant. It's a characteristic time for the system to relax to equilibrium, to its steady state equilibrium, which is just zero here. So what we're going to eventually do next week, and why this is relevant is, if you look at a fluid particle here and a sound wave comes by, okay, the sound wave, let's say it's a compression, this fluid particle is going to respond to that. It's going to compress, right? It wants to, it wants to go to this new equilibrium because of, some, because of the higher pressure. There will be some lag in time there due to viscosity. It won't respond instantly. And similarly, when the, when, the sound wave, when the sound wave rarefies, it's going to want to expand, but it doesn't expand instantaneously due to, vis due to viscosity. And we now know this is the characteristic time that you have to wait 
the, the four to, you know, to reach equilibrium. Okay, so here's our equation, our, our general equation, including viscous losses in the bulk. <coughs> and now it's natural to look for solutions here, right? And we're going to we'll consider, instead of jumping into traveling plane wave solutions, we're going to, it's better here to be a little bit more general and first assume that we're looking at a harmonic time response. So we're looking at something that's oscillating sinusoidally in time. Everything's oscillating sinusoidally in time. Uh, okay, that's not actually completely true because we can have losses here, right? So that, you know, due to the viscosity, the amplitude of a sound wave is going to attenuate, it's going to go down. So, but over a short time scale, things are just oscillating sinusoidally. So we'll assume they'll make the usual um, stipulation that we're dealing with time varying system, okay, harmonically time varying here. Okay, yeah, I can see. <clears throat> uh, this problem of this, we, we got, I, I, we've got a little bit of a problem here that I didn't notice when I was preparing. We're assuming this is something sinusoidal lasting time, but we know that, it, that the amplitude is going to attenuate, right? So, the way to, there's a simple way around that. Imagine the standard case that somebody's, you're generating a sound wave here. The wave is propagating this way, okay? What's going to happen to the amplitude in the presence of dissipation? It's going to go down, obviously, by energy conservation, because the fluid's heating up. But if you go to each point, it's only, even though the amplitude is decreasing, at each point, the acoustical motion is oscillating harmonically in time. So there's no problem. Um, there's no problem with this harmonic assumption. So I didn't realize this before, but technically we should apply this, we should think of applying this to a traveling wave. A tra in our case, you know, a traveling plane wave. Simplest case. Now, we can take this and substitute it into the lossy wave equation. And here's what you get. Okay, now, um, maybe this is, a, I guess this is the first time we've seen this. This is a comp, I've gone, we have to go complex here. You know, we've gone, we went complex right here, right? And because it's so convenient. And this may look strange to you, you know, we got this I here, but it's no problem, everything's complex, we just carry it along. All right? We put this in the standard form, it's called the Helmholtz, this is Helmholtz equation. So Laplacian on P, plus something times p is equal to zero. That something here we'll call k squared because it has the right, it's natural to call it k squared because the units, the right, you know, k has units of inverse length. This is units of inverse length. So we'll call it k squared. It has to be complex in our case now. And here it is. You can do this in your head. When you go from here to here, you look at the coefficient of p right here. Here is what it is the square, the, the square root of it, okay, is equal, is equal to this. Now, this is a, for any given frequency, this is a complex number. It's, it has to have a real and an imaginary part. We'll call the real part k. This is going to be the normal wave vector. This is going to be 2 pi over the wavelength, so we call it k. And now we've got this additional imaginary part. Now you'll notice that something's been done here. We, where did that minus sign come from? Well, the minus sign is just a convenient, um, it, it's just convenient here. What we're going to find in practice when we do this is, in our case, in our case here, we're going to find that this, it, that alpha here is negative. If you have a plus sign here, alpha will be negative. So we're going to go ahead and put the minus sign in here, and you'll see why in, right now. 
It's very easy to see this. So we're going to assume that alpha s is positive. That the imaginary part of this is negative, and we're going to make that explicit with that negative sign. So then therefore this alpha, what we're calling alpha sub s, will be positive. So the next part is really easy. If you take this k, we know that this is going to be a solution. This is the plane wave solution, right? Because that's, that's the plane wave solution to this equation. This k here is bold, however. I don't know if you can see it, but it's bold. It looks, it, it looks kind of bold, OK? If we substitute the fact that k has a real and an imaginary part now, and we extract out the real part, that we get an i times an i times minus, uh, we end up with, we've got <laughs> a minus, if you go through the minus signs here, we've got a minus, a minus, an i times an i, it ends up being minus. And look at this, this could not be simpler. What's our wave, what's our, tra this is a, this is, we should be taking a traveling, a plane traveling wave here. What's its amplitude doing? It's decaying in space, this is traveling in the positive x direction, it's decaying exponentially in space. And the rate at which it decays, this, this exponential coefficient here, is, is this quantity right here. We have to take the imaginary, we have to find the imaginary part of that. <coughs> so I want to make sure everyone sees this. This is actually uh, very simple here. Once you, and this is done a lot, people do this in other you know, electromagnetic waves, uh, any kind of waves. If you want to just get attenuation into your, into the mathematics here, it, it just, that's called phenomenological. You don't care where it's coming from. You just want to be more realistic. You want to say, look, I know this wave's going to die out. How do you, how do I get it in my theory? Well, you let K become complex. You let it become here because you can see that when you take this and substitute it into here, you get this exponential decay. So this is a common phenomenological thing to do without regard to the actual physical source of something coming about. Um, here, we've derived it. It's not ph phenomenological. We've derived this. Uh, very reasonable, very reasonable result. This alpha here is called the spatial, and that's apparently what the S is for in KFCS, I, I think. <laughs> um, it's called the spatial absorption coefficient, right? Now we're going to use, for us, the diff there's essentially no difference between absorption and attenuation. Yeah, there, if, if, uh, if you talk to an old acoustician, they'll draw a distinction, but I, I think, you know, not many of them are around anymore, so I don't have to worry about it. So. When we talk about absorption or attenuation, it's the same thing. We're losing energy to some, to some loss mechanism. For what we've dealt with here, it's viscosity. Viscosity. <coughs> now, we need to find out. This is important, obviously. We need to find out what this is. So it looks like we're going to have to take the... This, is gonna, this has a real and imaginary part. We can actually determine it. And that would take, that takes a little bit of algebra. And we don't have to do it, and here's why. It's mentioned in KFCS. <coughs> it turns out, and we will verify this tomorrow when we plug some numbers in, that for typical acoustics situations, this tau sub s is extremely small. And by small, I mean, you know, shorter than a nanosecond. It's really, it's really tiny here. So what that means is, <coughs> To get um, a time delay there, to get, to get dissipation, you have to have frequencies that are pretty high because the, a noticeable effect only occurs when omega, the frequency of the wave times tau s, is roughly of the order of one. So because this is so small, the omega has to be so high. And it turns out when you plug numbers in, just rough numbers, that the frequency is so high, which means the wavelength is so small, that the wavelength is comparable to the mean free path in a fluid. The mean free path is the average diff distance a molecule travels before it collides with another one. We haven't talked about that in this course because we've assumed a continuum. Our whole theory here is for, we're not taking into account molecules and atoms, 
right? We, never, we haven't even talked about it until right now. So um, there is an assumption in fluid dynamics, standard fluid dynamics, that the length scale over which things change, which is a wavelength for acoustics, is, um, is large compared to the mean free path, so that you can use nice continuum theory, not have to worry about the fact that you're dealing with particles. Interestingly enough, there are some loss mechanisms that inherently involve molecules. You cannot just turn a blind eye to molecules. You just can't adopt a continuum theory. And we're going to go through that next week. OK, so what's nice about this is we only care about free. We can't apply acoustics for the, we can't achieve this. The frequency is too high. The whole fluid description is breaking down. You have to go to a more, a more difficult, you know, more elaborate theory. We can make that assumption in here. This is nice for us. Because we don't have to exactly determine the real and the imaginary parts here. Because all we care about is omega tau s being small. So we're going to expand that. Makes it a lot simpler. Now, I want to warn you, we're not always going to be able to get away with this. There are some loss mechanisms that are very noticeable, and they're out there in the ocean, where this is not, we won't be able to do this. But we'll wait, we'll, we'll deal with that when we have to. For right now, because this is small, we might as well just expand this denominator, here's the uh, Taylor expansion or binomial expansion, however you want to look at it. Going out, I've taken it, I've gone you know, one more term here, and um, you'll, you'll see why. So here's the simple thing that we've dealt with before. One over the square root of one plus a small quantity is approximately one minus one half that quantity. We've talked about this kind of thing before, so that's this. And here's the next, the next term. This is, of course, valid for omega tau being small. So now we look at the real part here. That's going to be 2 pi over the wavelengths of the wave. We look at the real part here, and we get this, OK? And we look at the imaginary part, and that's what we were after, actually, is the spatial absorption coefficient. When you equate you know, this to this, you get this. If you then substitute our expression for tau s, we get this. And this is an important equation. We'll be dealing with this a lot. It's called the, well, I'm getting ahead, but this is, we're going to be dealing with this. Here's the absorption coefficient for viscous losses due to, due to viscosity for a sound wave. And um, we're going to find that no matter what bulk losses, it happens to be, boundaries get kind of complicated. And all you have to do is glance at KFCS to see that. Things don't behave nicely there. They behave nicer here. But again, we're not going to do that case. When you deal in the bulk, it turns out this is always true. See this omega squared here? OK. This, you've all heard this. Um, right? When a, a, a car just traveling by outside, you could be in a house or some uh, structure or something, and there's some lo loud bass noise coming, and you hear it clearly, and it's really annoying, right? Well, the frequency is low. You can see that the absorption is going to zero as the square of the frequency. Not just as the frequency, but the square of the frequency. So this means sound, low frequency sound attenuates much, much less. So it's just going right through the walls, right? And, you know, there ought to be a law against it. And I guess maybe there is some places, but, but you know, we're lagging behind in a, acoustical pollution compared to other types of pollution. Have you noticed that? And it's a, it's a serious problem. But it's being, slowly being addressed. But anyway, so there's a, there's a problem here. Now, if you're an elephant, it's, it's a good thing because elephants, it wasn't until the 1970s that elephants, uh, we, we recognized that Elephants were actually communicating with each other over large distances. And the reason we didn't know is that they communicate at infrasound, about roughly 10 hertz or a little below, and we can't hear there. So we were just biasing the situation. But a uh, Cornell researcher uh, stumbled, I can't remember her name, and that uh, sparked a whole lot of, of research. And. Uh, you can see here, though, 
that the elephants, it's, they can communicate over kilometers. And the reason it's, it's this omega squared here is the reason, basically, because it's, there's very little attenuation at such low frequencies. So the story I heard is that, and I've seen a picture of this, there was this truck with a loudspeaker on it, and they were blasting some infrasound. So people, humans couldn't hear it, and it was, they were, they were playing some kind of mating call, okay? And they, they looked around and nothing happened, okay? And then they waited a while, and then all of a sudden there was this, this like stampede of male elephants coming towards this truck, okay? Because they had come from a long distance. That was a story I heard. I don't know if it's true. It's a good story. Uh, okay. Now, I want to point something out here. Let's, we, we have more information. We have, this is the, K is not equal to omega C anymore. Now, it deviates by only a small amount. Remember, this is going to be small for us right now, anyway. This, for, for viscous losses, this is small. But you can see that we don't have omega is equal to CK. We have a frequency dependence. What does that mean for the speed of the sound? See, omega is equal to CK, right? The speed of waves is going to be omega. Well, this is the real part. The real part. So the fact that this is now frequency independent means technically that the speed of sound depends upon the frequency. A whole new set of phenomena come in. It's called a dispersive wave. We're not, we don't have disperse, dispersive, dispersionless waves anymore. We have dispersion. However, so it's, it's exciting from a physicist's point of view. It's very exciting because there's all kinds of interesting phenomena that can occur, in particular nonlinear phenomena, like solitons, uh, waves, nonlinear waves that act like particles. However, I'm not aware of much research that's been done on that. And the reason is this is going to, for right now, this is very small for us. Right? So it's a small effect. Uh, okay. Any, any questions? Okay, so there's a weird week. There's a problem set tomorrow, right? And then there'll be a quiz, but it's just going to be on Chapter 7.